speakers. The first on the list is Associate Vice President Chris Kazikian. 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 I apologize. Everyone calls him Chris. I have no idea why I've been called all my life. <laughs> and he is in charge of research and I believe it's graduate studies. Yes. Always confuse that with research and grants, the research and graduate That's studies. And he has had a long time interest in how we could work together doing some things organized around data. So I thought I'd put him up first. Chris Charles. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. Um, thank you, everyone, for having me. And I have to, my um, caveat here is I'm not a big data or a large data or even a medium data scientist. I, I was an environmental scientist that worked on bench scale and field work. So if I got 20 good data points, I was happy. Um, so I don't know much about the big data aspects of this or, or any size of data aspect of this. But I, there are a few things that I've been thinking about and trying to do uh, on this campus that I think are kind of coalescing and are manifesting itself in some of the conversations I already heard and I, and I hope we'll hear later. Um, I am the Associate VP for Research and Graduate Studies, which means all the grants that go out of this campus go through my office, which means, and, uh, and I want to give kudos to Andrew Weiss, you have a handout in front of you, and in here he talks about a data management plan, the structure of a data management plan, and then the repository. Uh, we know it as ScholarWorks, but it's also SOAR, ScholarWorks Open Access Repository. And on the back of this, it gives you all the agencies and their sort of um, open access or open data policies or requests. Uh, I'm glad this is here because this is exactly what I want to talk about. Um, and the question is, um, what are we doing on this campus? What can we do better on this campus? And how do we use our bait? How can we better use our data uh, on this campus? Um, I'm going to start with four things that I'm trying to get to get to convince you is what we are going to do and uh, end up with. One is we, we want to put the data to good use. Um, and we're all worried about being scooped and being published before we get published. And I have a story, a very personal story about that, which I'll, I'll share. Um, we want to design and create a data management infrastructure that includes a data management plan. And I know ScholarWorks is there as well. And we're into com in conversations already. And I've talked to Mark a number of times about what's appropriate uh, data infrastructure for storage and management and dissemination. The other part of my interest is to promote interdisciplinary research. I can't tell you how many times I've been in a meeting where actually this happened to us, uh, a computer scientist, and I don't see her in the room, and a musician, and I don't see him in the room. We're sitting next to each other, and we start talking. Like, oh, you do this. Oh, I do this. Let's, let, let's exchange emails. And they wrote down their emails. And six months later, they got a $300,000 grant to do something together. And we want to make that by not accident, but by design, um, hopefully. And then, of course, being in the CSU system and being, having that new focus on student success and student engagement and student graduation, how do we engage students in this uh, in analysis and working with data as a high impact practice, but also, as you mentioned earlier, to prepare them for the workforce. Students from all over the campus, not necessarily in the data science departments, have interest and skills in this. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a big picture of what's going on with the foundations and agencies, give you a couple stories, and then end with a plea for you to help me do something, uh, help us do something for this campus. Uh, Ford's, Ford Foundation, Gates Foundation, Packard Foundation, uh, uh, Open Society Foundation, which arguably are the largest and most influential foundations, grant-giving foundations in the world, all require publishing under a Creative Commons license. Um, you have to share your data. And I'm going to dig into the gates a little bit because they're probably the most uh, rogue or aggressive um, with this. Gates requires that publications will be accessible and open immediately. They require that the data underlying published results will be also uh, open and accessible. And this is the, the part they push more. They can't, and you can't have any restrictions on further use of that data. For commercial and non commercial use, you can do whatever you want with those data. Uh, and the objective is for them is to promote and, and ensure that we get the fullest possible public health benefits from the data that's generated from the money that they give. Um, and as you know, they fund uh, public health projects all over the world. The other um, things they want to promote, the intention to promote is innovation, obviously, collaboration, efficiency, so we're not duplicating efforts, accountability, so that the money spent is producing data that's usable, and also it's capacity building. What, what is this data and the results from this data doing to the next generation of scientists and science itself? Um, the publications have to be discoverable and accessible online. And they're also unique in this case. The foundation will actually pay for open access um, to, to publications. So if you publish in Nature and Science nowadays, you have to pay thousands of dollars to make that open access. Gates Foundation will actually pay for that, which is fantastic. 
Going through the agencies, and I'm just gonna run through these real quick. These are the big three that fund us, National Science Foundation, NSF, National Institutes of Health, NIH, and the US Department of Education, USDE. Um, we get most of our funding and large grants from these three institutions. NSF, you have to promptly publish all significant findings. You have to share primary data, samples, physical collections, and other materials as soon as possible. They encourage sharing of software and inventions um, when applicable, when they don't have marching rights to come in and take it away from you. And they, they require a data management plan in your submission. So how are you gonna deal with your data? And this is becoming a huge problem for not just the genomics field, but most fields are, are gathering and producing a lot of data. NIH, same sort of thing, except expect the timely release of sh and sharing of final research data. And if you write a grant with direct costs more than half a million dollars, you need to address the data sharing in your application. Um, that's a pretty large grant, but still data sharing is a big deal. Department of Education expects timely release of shared data files following the completion of a study. There's all nuances here, right? Following publication, following completion of a study. But the, the, the heart of it is they want the data to be accessible. Data will be available for at least 10 years after the completion of the study. Uh, a data management plan is required and the cost of data sharing may be included in the grant, which is good news to people in the library who actually want data sharing uh, and build the infrastructure. Um, so for faculty who submit grants, the data management plan, we can help you put that together, but also uh, Andrew has produced a um, uh, outline that you can go through and they can help you also put it together. And at some point we're gonna have a, a more seamless way to get data management pl plan out there. But traditionally data management plans um, were focused on, um, and, I'll get, and I have a little bit of an example of the template we put out there. General, the general conversation is that it will be presented in publications or upon request or through scholar works. That's the kind of language we use um, to talk about our data. The, you have to talk about the kind of data you're gonna generate and how you expect to manage it, the period you're gonna retain the data, how are you gonna store it and preserve it, and then the sharing and access of the primary data. Those are the kinds of things that generally go into a data management plan, and that's what you need to think about before you apply. I have two stories um, to tell you, and these are, um, one is very personal, and one is something I heard that, that talks about what open access to data can do. And I'll tell you the one that doesn't have to do with me first. Uh, I was at a, at, a, uh, at a conference at the NIH, and one of the NIH program directors got up. He used to be the journal editor for the quote unquote big data journals. Um, and he got a submission once. It was this beautifully written paper that used publicly accessible data to track the, the movement of disease uh, across the world. So they looked at commodity shipment, uh, flight patterns, uh, all kinds of things. And um, he sent it out to review, and these are his words verbatim. They came back from three reviewers, almost flawless paper, minor, minor changes. He looks at the author, he's never heard the name of the person. Um, the author has no affiliation except the home address and an email address. And he's like, who the heck is this? And this is a person who's in Bethesda, Maryland, and the author was in San Diego. He's like, I gotta meet this person. So contact her, they have an email exchange, they set up an appointment. He flies across country to go to San Diego to meet this person, walks in, and it's a 15-year-old high school girl <laughs> who on the weekends and at nights was downloading all these data and just did the analysis on her own and published this amazing paper. So that's what's possible with kids, quote unquote, who we don't think are, are quite there yet. They can. My story is, I, I was a faculty member at Cal State LA, and as most Cal State faculty know, we struggle to get that grant. We struggle to publish our work. We don't have the army of postdocs and PhD students that help us sort of churn the papers out. And we came up with this idea, actually, my, my wife did her postdoc at Caltech, and it was her advisor at Caltech who said, you should look at phosphite, and we were environmental scientists, uh, everyone knows phosphate, everyone, everyone knows phosphorus and, and the cycling of life and its, its role in, um, in life, but phosphite is a pretty unstable precursor to phosphate that may have existed in quote unquote early earth. So like, why don't you look at that? And, and the reason for that is we, we were working uh, um, in the geothermal waters up at Mammoth and yes, we did vacation there as we took samples. Um, and that environment is conducive to the, to the formation of phosphite. So we put this proposal together, which we thought was a brilliant proposal, and it was part of a center, and it got funded, and then we started the work. About a year or two later, a very famous environmental scientist started publishing like crazy on this phosphite thing. 
Uh, he published methods, he published field sampling in the same place that we were field sampling. I mean, it was like publication after publication, and we probably got two publications out of it, and this guy probably got about eight in two years. He got an award for his award work, award, um, groundbreaking work in phosphite and all this stuff. And I just have to think that guy was on the panel that reviewed my proposal. So I was really upset at this because I looked at his track record, I looked at his colleagues, and no one had ever published on phosphite. And all of a sudden, here's this um, outpouring of data. But for a moment, I stopped and said, is it about me and that third paper I was going to get two years later? Or is it about really pushing the science forward? Is it about what we can do with science if you actually uh, share the data? Um, I just got the one minute warning. It frazzled me. Yeah. Sorry. OK. Um, so anyway. The, the that, fact, your faculty who have to publish. Right? Yes, 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 yes. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Go write your papers. Um, <laughs> so, so the idea here is what, let's not think about us and what we can do, but what can be done with the data that's generated, especially with data that is publicly funded. So and I'm glad you gave me that mandate to finish because what I hope to do is, working with the library, and we've had preliminary conversations on this, is to do something like a data fest. Uh, we were going to call it data jam because we have the app jam, but something in the spring where we present students with data, whether it's a researcher who wants to share their data or institutional data looking at, for example, student success markers, whatever the data is, can we present that in a data fest-like environment and have students work on this, curated by faculty, supported by faculty, and as my zero second Warning is up. This is my plug for you to join us and help us organize this. And I know Wayne is um, very interested in working with us. So I'll stop there and take any questions. And um, sorry I went over. Questions for our Associate Vice President. One of the nice things about having an on-campus uh, on event is that you know where to find it. Yeah, I'm going nowhere. Yes? Yeah, I have a question. And I'm not from CSU Northridge. Sure. But, um, Good. I, I'm, know where you're from. I'm from data site. I'm, oh. I'm, so I'm going to be talking later today. But I have a question. Did the phosphorus people, did they give you credit for your data? No. But they didn't give, it wasn't our data. It was just a proposal. So they oh, read it I see. I and see. ran away with it. We think. Um, and I have one other question. Sure. Is um, the, uh, the, um, the licensing policy, the, um, what is it that you're proposing? The open access? No, no, no. The, um, the Creative Commons. Yes. Is that in conflict with your university? Is the university saying that, um, so as all these agencies and foundations say, you need to make your data open and freely available, yes. is your university also saying, it's OK, we don't own that data? Yes. OK. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Any other questions? And are you going to send an email around, do you think? I'm inviting faculty for participation. Do you need to brief the executives some more? No, I, I, so. Go through committees? No committees, no executives. I just need two or three able bodies and volunteers to, to join with me. And I see a hand up there. Is that a volunteer hand? I'm sorry. Right. <laughs> After our speaker was mentioning it, I, I'm the head of the math club, but I also work on some data mining. Yes. And I already decided we would run it in math, you know? So uh, if you're going to. No, I mean, like, I'll do it with you. Yes, let's do it mean, up. Like, like, I thought it was such a great idea. And uh, actually, you're looking at someone who could um, help us. Fantastic. Be the center person right there, Saeed. I'm going to contact you. Nice to meet you, nice to you as well. <laughs> thank you very much. OK, thank you, Chris. Sure. Um, our thinking for faculty talks was the most important uh, in addition to the, the, key, the morning sessions and afternoon, afternoon sessions, uh, plenary sessions. And our thinking was to get a variety of faculty from different disciplines to talk about their definitions of open. And uh, we thought for the first talk that made the most amount of sense and then we can do other things uh, over the months and over the years as, as necessary. Um, our first talk is from, um, and, and all of these are posted online on the link. We didn't send out the link, I don't think, yet to everybody, but we will. So or maybe you did yesterday. On your program, you will see at the bottom a bit.ly link. I apologize for the caps, because only after I made it, I realized, gosh, that's hard on a phone, but it's the, the caps. 
Um, that is a link to our online program. It's mobile friendly and there are links to presenter bios and presentations. Not all the presentations are there because we didn't have them yesterday. But you can review some of this stuff now and we'll put them up as quickly as we can. Okay. And then we'll let everyone know where the video is posted as well. So that was our thinking and you can always get a hold of people later on because the bios and abstracts are there with emails and you don't even need the emails. You can Google people's names. Um, uh, our first, um, I've been on campus uh, 35 years, so you would think I like know people and know what they're doing. Answer, no. I don't know what people are doing. I don't always make, a, I make the wrong assumptions about the wrong disciplines, about the wrong things. I'm basically wrong on just about everything, okay? Um, the, our first speaker, he and I share a common uh, attribute. We're both ham radio operators, so we've been talking a little bit about that technique and I've been learning more about what he does with his students, and he's in chemistry, so I didn't think to ask a bunch of open source and open data type questions until we started talking about uh, what assumptions and expectations he makes and what he does with his students. And so I thought I'd start, we thought we'd start first with Juicy Eloranta from chemistry. Okay, uh, good morning everyone. Uh, my name is Justi Eloranta. I'm from the chemistry department. I'm a, a physical chemist over there. So my work is somewhere between uh, physics and chemistry as the uh, discipline uh, <coughs> indicates. And I'll tell you a little bit about uh, uh, open source solutions that we use in, uh, in my group and uh, specifically in uh, both research and education. Uh, from the research side, uh, I can mention some benefits for this, that we, uh, uh, we basically uh, combine forces with other people, so there's collaborative uh, uh, software development, so that saves a lot of time. Uh, there's also competition, there are multiple projects, whatever uh, project is, uh, does things better than the other uh, will basically win and that, that becomes the, the standard in the field. Uh, also, since we have uh, the source code available, we actually know how things work, we can fix things, and uh, we don't have to rely on some, some uh, big company hoping that uh, someday they would uh, fix this problem and we could move forward. Also, flexibility that comes with having source code. We can modify the source code and uh, we, we can make it do whatever we want. And uh, last, since I'm just a poor uh, physical chemist, uh, we need to think about money, uh, reduced cost, so we don't have to pay any licensing fees to anyone. We basically develop everything by ourselves. Okay, so that's from the research side. Uh, for education, uh, we think about, uh, again, uh, about cost. Obviously, if we produce our own uh, study material to students, uh, that reduces cost. And students don't have to spend their money on buying books and such. Also, uh, we can tailor this material so to turn it into focused learning material so that because we know our student base and we know what their problems are. So we can exactly write things so that uh, they understand, uh, understand the topic. Uh, and <clears throat> since we are a CSU, we have a fairly high teaching loads, so we need to optimize things so that we do have time for research. So whenever we maintain our own study material, we don't have to worry about is, is the fourth edition coming out, do I have to change my lectures to correspond to that? So we have in-house control of this material. So these are, these are big advantages. So they work from both money perspective as well as from a time perspective. Of course, there's some initial investment uh, going into this uh, time-wise. Uh, going to the research side first, uh, uh, just a quick overview of the computational uh, research infrastructure in my lab. So we basically uh, run any, everything under Linux, so everything is open source. So I usually say that my lab is a Windows and Mac free area. There are none of these closed source uh, operating systems. Uh, we basically maintain this whole setup uh, in-house. We build our computers from scratch by ourselves with students so they get, get to have the first-hand uh, knowledge of uh, how, how to do things and not just to rely on ready-made solutions. So. Uh, <coughs> The computations themselves, they are run on uh, uh, several parallel servers. These are typically 64 core uh, uh, systems where we, uh, do a where, we, where we run our uh, parallel codes. Here are a couple of uh, examples of uh, uh, open source codes that we are housing in my group. Uh, the first two are related to my research directly. So these are uh, 
related to time dependent the density functional theory calculations and uh, the, the URL looking uh, path over there is pointing to git that's an open source uh, uh, <coughs> distributed source code development system developed by Linus Torvalds who is also uh, the father of uh, Linux operating system and by the way, uh, by the time he started uh, uh, working on Linux, that was in Finland, I'm from Finland as well. So uh, uh, we actually set up the first uh, Linux uh, uh, classroom in Finland there, and uh, we were working together back then. Of course, Linux has uh, grown, grown quite a bit uh, since those days. Okay, so those two are related to my research, the first two ones. Uh, projects and uh, I'm giving you roughly the idea about the magnitude of these projects, how, how many source code lines uh, we have over there. Of course, uh, it doesn't tell you the whole story. In principle, you could have a uh, hundred thousand lines of code and it's all common, right? So, but uh, these actually do something. <coughs> uh, the third one is what we use in uh, experiments. So we do both experiments and uh, theory. So it's uh, interfacing uh, scientific instruments, and this is where data collection comes in. We do. Uh, 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 fast uh, uh, photography and this generates a tremendous amount of data. And the last program, uh, it's still in use. I wrote that when I was a grad student a long time ago and uh, uh, it was meant to replace some of these expensive uh, closed source solutions for electron spinners and spectrometers. Here's a quick overview of one of the experimental setups that we've been playing recently. So all this is Linux based. We actually uh, uh, <coughs> write the required device drivers by ourselves. Uh, the students don't get I into writing device drivers that much because it uh, requires rather special special knowledge. But uh, uh, they do get to uh, do the, the end, end user programming. And for example, in this particular application, we are doing nanosecond time scale uh, shadow graph photography, and uh, we are looking at things like uh, like uh, uh, vortex rings. So this is uh, a vortex ring in liquid, which has a diameter of 400 micrometers. So we are doing time-resolved experiments, looking at the dynamics, how these vortex rings evolve. And uh, uh, basically this uh, Linux computer is controlling a uh, couple of lasers over there, and uh, as well as a fast, uh, fast uh, video camera. So everything is uh, done with uh, open source uh, software. Here's an example of uh, the computational work. Uh, this is about uh, nanometer scale. Uh, uh, viscose response of liquids. This is a, a model system. We have electron in the liquid helium at very low temperature. And we are just seeing how, how this uh, velocity field develops around this electron when it's uh, moving in the liquid. Uh, these are run on these, uh, these parallel servers. So we do uh, open MPI uh, programming. So these, all these rely on open source compilers like the GNU-C compiler. Uh, FFTW3 uh, uh, library, which is a Fourier transformation library, and uh, the two libraries that, that we have written. The visualization, again, open source tools, we are using uh, uh, Visit and Paraview over there. One minute. Yeah, okay. Uh, then finally, I would like to uh, point out that uh, we use open source tools for education as well. Here are a couple of our course notes. Again, these are almost like textbooks. They are becoming textbooks, they are like uh, 400 pages. And uh, these are uh, hosted again uh, in open source repositories so everybody can download them and contribute. And of course, if somebody wants to say something, then uh, it comes to me for review and then we'll put it in. And uh, an another nice thing about open source is that it provides uh, multi platform solutions. So uh, students can use Windows and Mac if they like, but they can, of course, use Linux. Uh, and here are a couple of the, uh, the biggest ones that we're using. Uh, Maxima, for example, for uh, symbolic math. Uh, a QTI plot for analyzing and plotting data. Uh, LibreOffice for producing uh, uh, documents. And uh, then finally, there's uh, LaTeX that is uh, used for uh, document processing. Okay, thank you for your attention. Okay, good. Cool. <laughs> Questions for a chemistry professor? about computations, math, and stat. Saeed. I have a loud noise doing this point. Pardon? I'll, oh, we're recording it, so. Awesome. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I had a question. Um, do you do any simulation of, for instance, drug delivery systems? Uh, say again, what's Do you do any simulations on protein foldings or? Uh, protein folding, uh, <coughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm a physical chemist. For me, uh, like uh, when you have more than three atoms, it's, it's plenty. 
So okay, a protein, enough. I can't count that how many atoms you have over there. <laughs> Any, anyway, it's a challenging problem, and uh, people use uh, molecular dynamic simulations to do this, but yes, uh, yeah. this is a little bit out of my area. Because uh, 64 cores of CPU just sounds super amazing. Oh, it, it could, yeah, it would. It would uh, work well for that. Awesome. And uh, these systems actually are amazingly cheap nowadays, so you can, you can build these from scratch as long as you know how to get the right motherboard and CPUs and, uh, and memory and so forth. Other questions? I, I have one question. Mm -hmm. Juicy, obviously you, you want your students to go into chem, probably master's programs and PhD yes. programs. But dealing with the computation and all the other stuff, does that help them with the non-chem stuff? Does that help them be data scientists if they don't want to pursue a chem degree, or, or how are, how? Okay. In other words, how do you wrap professional concerns okay. that so, are different than academic expectations? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I usually keep uh, quite uh, uh, tight track on what these students, uh, what their plans are, because very often they they don't think about the future. So, uh, so pretty much weekly, I tell you that where do you want to go? What do you want to be? And of course, many of them, oh yeah, I want to be a physical chemist. But then you realize that, okay, you need to get to academia and uh, there are not that many jobs over there. So all this computer business that we do over there, this is like a plan B. And probably that plan B will pay 100 times more than, than the plan A. Yeah? <laughs> okay, I, I shouldn't be laughing. I mean, it's a serious topic. It's just, I don't know how we address it yeah. in different majors, both yeah. STEM and non-STEM yeah. is a really important issue. Yeah. Thanks again, Jesse. All right. Continuing with our uh, 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 beginnings with STEM, it's not because it's more important, it was just easy to coordinate the talks that way, is Rachel McEnbark, 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 sorry, I, I've been working on them all week, and I didn't get it, uh, from biology. Um, she was actually referred to me from Stan, I'm, I'm gonna pronounce and mispronounce his last name, Metzenberg, uh, couldn't be with us here today, who also does a, a lot of work in computational biology, uh, but Rachel, uh, Rachel also has uh, a good deal of infrastructure on campus and just won a, did I have that right, a $1.3 million NASA grant um, to work with her students. So congratulations on that too. Thank you. Thank you. You're up, Rachel. Okay. All right. I'm on? Yeah. You're Excellent. Up. All right. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit today about challenges in big data as it relates to biology. So biologists are fairly new to big data. It's only been very recently that we've had to deal with some of those challenges. And so I'm going to talk about what specifically those challenges are. And then I'm going to talk a little bit, I'm going to use this, um, this forum as a means to talk about uh, how we want to deal with those challenges in the biology department in the university. So uh, uh, much more, I think, specific uh, necessities that we're going to be facing if we want to um, uh, our research to stay current. So uh, as you can guess from the title, uh, our challenges in big data and the biology uh, realm come from DNA sequence data. And for those of you who haven't had a biology course in a while, this is uh, DNA. So the take home message is that when we sequence DNA, when we generate a genome, what we end up with are very large files that are made up of A, C's, T's, and G's. So you open up this text file and it's uh, A, C, T's, and G's for billions and billions and billions of bases uh, that correspond to these base pairs. So I'm going to give you a brief history of DNA sequencing, uh, starting with the Human Genome Project. Uh, the human genome is about 3 billion of these bases of these ATCs and Gs. And it took 10 years to sequence the human genome and approximately $2.7 billion, and that's in 1991 dollars. So an enormous project, a very successful project, um, and very expensive. Now, if you look at this chart here, on the y-axis is the cost per genome, and on the x is year. So you can see around uh, 2001, 2002, we had gotten the cost per genome down to about $100 million. 
Uh, and as you would expect, technology improves, uh, costs improve. And something happened, though, right in about 2006, 2007. And the costs dropped dramatically. And if you see the gray line, that's Moore's Law. So there, something happened around you know, 10, 12 years ago that dramatically decreased the cost of sequencing. And what that was is the, gener uh, the development of new next generation sequencing technologies. So a brand new way in which we can generate sequence that reduce the cost dramatically. And this graph ends at 2014, but you can see that the cost of sequencing a human genome is well below $10,000 now. And we have a uh, version of a next generation sequencing platform on campus. And even to do a genome here at CSUN wouldn't be very expensive. You know, we could take any one of your DNA, sequence it, analyze it, and it wouldn't be very expensive and wouldn't be too terribly difficult. So, cost goes down, and as a corollary or, or um, along with that is that the amount of sequence data that one can produce goes up dramatically. So here we have uh, the number of base pairs per sequence run. So that is if you put your DNA on one of these sequencing machines and then you wait anywhere from a few days to about a week and a half and you get data off, the amount per sequence run has increased dramatically. Note that this is a log scale. So in about 2006, 2007, we hit a point where one run, wait, wait a week or so, can generate one billion bases of data. And remember the human genome was three billion bases and took 10 years to, to sequence. So uh, in about 2011, that hit one trillion bases per run. And right now, the uh, most sophisticated machines will give you about 1.5 trillion bases in one run. So this is what uh, I often feel like uh, when I get these data files back. And as you can imagine, uh, the files themselves are pretty enormous. So you have 1.5 trillion uh, bases. You get the, the files back, and that's a lot, of, a lot of data that you have to deal with. So it's what has happened is that data generation is not the primary issue anymore. So it used to be that generating sequence data, uh, you'd go into your lab and you'd spend long, long, long times generating. And then the analysis part wouldn't be, it, would be, it wouldn't be the primary time consuming uh, component. Now, it doesn't take us long to get our data. Uh, it takes us years to analyze it. So I've got a couple of uh, projects right now that it was very easy, no, I should say very easy. It was reasonably, uh, a reasonable effort to generate the data for, and yet we're still digging through the data, and we've only just barely scratched the surface. So um, what I, oh, and uh, what has become of this is this whole genetics, genomics, uh, bioinformatics, I think is no longer a field, but a tool. And so every field of biology now is getting into this next generation sequencing and using that as a tool. And you can see evidence of this if you look at the number of PubMed articles that are mentioning next generation sequencing. So it's decre uh, increased very dramatically. Now, uh, besides being necessary for uh, a larger and larger range of biologists, it's becoming vital to train students in knowing how to deal with these data because it permeates every field of biology um, uh, from human genomics, which people usually think about, uh, to the research that I do that's related to uh, NASA. So it, it, it's very broad. So now I'm going to talk about the available computational resources in the biology department. Um, and talk about some of the things that we need to do to move forward to make sure that our faculty have the necessary resources that are available and so we can train our students. Uh, prior to about 2012, I joined the department in 2011, there were no large servers or computational resources in the biology department. Correct me if I'm wrong, biologist, but I wasn't aware of any large high-performance servers. Okay, I'm getting a, a no. 
So when I joined the department, uh, one of the big investments that, that uh, I put in was I used my startup funds to buy a uh, fairly large server. Uh, I, this particular server has a, a terabase of memory needed to do some of the computational uh, processes. So for a while, that was the only um, server in the department until we had uh, two new faculty members, uh, Drs. Cooper and Flores joined the department and they got another server and we linked them via an infinity band. So that's the state of the art in our department right now. Works really well for our labs, uh, but, oh, uh, so before I move into the but, uh, our current issues that we're having are backups. So our systems are a little bit ad hoc. We have our, um, our servers, and then we have another server that we back up data to. Uh, we need more disk space, we're constantly running out, data archiving, and I do more, much more system admin than I'd like to. So it works for right now, but it's not scalable. Looking forward, right now, uh, I let other biology faculty members use my server on a fairly regular basis, which is fantastic and I'm happy to collaborate but it's not sustainable for the long term as more and more people need to come and use those resources. So in conclusion, we need a strategy in the biology department to make these resources uh, available to students and faculty. Thank you. Okay, good. And my hunch is that it's wider than the biology department. Uh, she, she's just being kind. Questions for our colleague, Rachel. Said. Um, thank you for the talk. Um, regarding the processes that you mentioned, do you use any machine learning specific um, tools or algorithms to reduce a dimension of the data? Um, so none of the methods that I use right now uh, explicitly use machine learning. We do have a large number of open source programs and tools, which is one thing that I have to um, mention about the field of biology and genomics is a lot of their computational tools are open source. Uh, we don't develop a lot of sophisticated tools in-house. We do write a lot of scripts, uh, do a lot of programming, but we rely for the really sophisticated things on labs that are devoted to generating uh, those programs. And as I recall, you, were, you had some modules already done in Perl. If I'm not mistaken. Oh yeah, maybe back, back on from that. Well, no, I mean, I mean, uh, Perl and Python are the languages we use to code with in our lab. Um, back when I was a graduate student and I had to do heavy lifting, I used C, but uh, I tend to let other people do that who have, uh, who are uh, specifically their labs are set up to write these programs, whereas we want to. Uh, we're more interested in the questions that we're asking. So yes, we use Python. We use uh, Perl, we use oh. R. Uh, oh, good. But, uh, so you need the packages from Python and the packages from R, all, from R to do much of the work. Yeah, yeah well, and we write, a bunch of, we write a bunch of code that's specific to R data, not for distribution. One more question and then? Can you tell us briefly about your NASA project? Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that smile. So, <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> let me talk about my research. Okay, so uh, in brief, NASA is interested in if life exists on other planets, what might be some of the survival strategies that life uses? So we have a system which is the permafrost. It's permanently frozen soil. Uh, we use that as an analog for other potential cryogenic bodies in the universe because you know, Mars has permafrost. Uh, most of the other planets, comets, asteroids are cold. So what we've been trying to do is we've been trying to say, okay, if we can figure out how life survives over geologic time in frozen soil, then maybe we can get information about how, you know, what are some of the key survival strategies for life in those type of environments. So I spent the summer, or part of the summer in Siberia and, you know, go up to Alaska. So it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. Okay. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, moving from STEM to social scientists, some people call it social STEM. Um, for those, who, uh, 
uh, heard that term. Um, <laughs> for those of you who've been around for a while, you know that our geography department has been a regional and national leader in a number of different areas for a long period of time. Uh, um, and uh, Regan is going to talk a little bit about updates and some changes that she sees in her world. Uh, yeah, hi, my name is uh, Regan Moss. I'm an assistant professor in geography and also the associate director of the Center for Geographical Studies, which is a sort of in-house um, center we have that where we um, have roughly 15 to 40 students in paid internships working on projects both internally and with local, <coughs> regional, federal projects, um, doing a, an array of different things. And through sort of my work in both of those areas, I've seen a lot of change in, um, in the industry, and we've made a lot of changes in our um, department um, to correlate with that. And so what I want to do today is just sort of talk to you about what we've, the changes that we've made. Um, really, even since I've been here since 2011, there's been sort of an acceleration of these changes. Um, so I've been a part of seeing it. So we've seen a lot of change it's going from this sort of top-down idea in geography to a bottom-up. Um, a lot of it historically has been very authoritative. It's gotten a geography and GIS especially has gotten quite a knock for being um, very privileged and sort of big brother. Um, and we're seeing more of a shift in data now from being sort of that, that sort of authoritative agency base to being more volunteered. Um, volunteered geographic information is becoming really a very large area of data analysis work. Students are getting more and more sort of energized by that and getting information from those um, areas. We're seeing a lot more instead of large corporations and public agencies being interested in GIS, we're seeing a shift to sort of small firms, medium firms, consulting agencies. Um, instead of very siloed projects where we're going to keep our data and nobody sees our data. <laughs> um, to a lot of engagement and collaboration and different agencies coming together realizing these problems are very complex and we need to work together and therefore we need to be able to have some sort of interoperability um, and then going from sort of and, and especially as a very late seeing a lot of a shift from sort of well, I, I couldn't think of a good word for this traditional data small data whatever <laughs> to big or deep uh, data and so Historically, geography and, and the geospatial industry has had um, some initiatives that are in correlation with this. So for a long time, since for about roughly 20 years of their anniversary, the OGC or Open Geospatial Consortium has been creating standards and specifications for geospatial open source data. And sort of all the big hitters, not only the proprietary people, but also the open source individuals have been contributing to this. And now we also have a free and open source for geospatial conference that happens every year where people are getting together and sharing information and sharing standards and seeing what's coming next. And so there are a lot of um, really energizing opportunities for open source in the geospatial industry. Um, in our specific curriculum, just in the last five to six years, we've seen a lot of change. Um, we are, we kind of, we really keep on top of the job listings, as I'm sure you all do as well. And we're seeing more and more and more a need for open source skill, specific skill for data analysis in R and open source databases and things of that sort. So we've been integrating more and more. But we also have a good core of our students who are always interested in entrepreneurial um, sort of career aspirations. They want to be an independent consultant. And so having in their back pocket the skills for open source so they don't have to go to pay money to proprietary groups has really been useful for them and it's sort of broadened their opportunities and horizons. <laughs> we also are seeing many many more students working on interdisciplinary thesis projects or going out and working in local agencies who maybe need some solutions that they don't have the opportunities or capacity internally to um, to solve, but our students can actually plug in there and then they can, and when we give them the opportunities via sort of these open source options, um, it's really allowed them to help with these projects. <coughs> so in our curriculum, we've integrated in many different ways. Obviously data is one of the most um, obvious ways that we've integrated open source. Um, we've integrated throughout our curriculum in different, not only in the physical side, the GS side, and our human side, we sort of have this sort of tripartite um, department. But we have, you know, we work with uh, the local 
open source geo, geo portals from the city, the county, the state. We also are using OpenStreetMap. Uh, if you maybe you might not, may or may not be um, aware of what OpenStreetMap is, it's sort of a crowdsourced street map where people are actually contributing. It's really interesting, fine details, some details that maybe you wouldn't necessarily get from a Google. Um, also, the US Census being open, open topography, and several other sort of remotely sensed or satellite imagery type um, data sources we're integrating into not only our physical courses, but also into our human side courses. We're sort of on trying to understand populations and how they're growing and why they're growing and etc. We also are integrating um, open source options in especially in our uh, Masters of Science in, in GIS uh, or GI Science. Um, we are integrating not only open source uh, GIS programs, so instead of just ARC, we're now integrating QGIS. Um, we are integrating, uh, we have a whole course actually designed, designed around programming in Python for customization and for data mining and things of that sort. We also are in our spatial database class, have included uh, work with our with Postgres and PostGIS so that we can not only have sort of independent database design, but also talking about how that can be integrated with some of the proprietary software that's out there. ArcGIS is sort of figuring this out, if those of you might be familiar with ArcGIS. Uh, and then we also have uh, two or three courses where we actually are integrating open source geostatistical analysis using not only OpenGeoDA, but R. My I have a graduate level course where we talk, all we do is talk about R and sort of the geostatistical packages. We're talking to Wayne about the many libraries, which sometimes frightens people, but eventually they get through it and they actually are really um, enjoying the process. We also do a lot of web design. We have whole web courses that are designed around mostly open source information. Amazing. <laughs> and then we also have courses and coursework where students are grabbing um, some data, not only from open source remotely sensed satellite imagery, but also drone imagery. We have a few students who are running drones of their own. And then also capturing geotag social media information um, from Twitter, et cetera, and gathering this sort of big data and analyzing the spatial components. One minute. One minute. <laughs> uh, to go over a few projects that we have going on um, through the center and the department. One right now we have um, a partnership with the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management where we are taking their geologic and geophysical data set, creating geodatabases, sort of creating sort of geotagged information from their deep well information and then running some sort of machine learning um, analyses using open source Python scikit-learn. Um, we also are working with Squirt, Southern California Coastal Water Research Project, um, which is essentially talking sort of the, the predicting that we were talking about, predicting lo location and flow of non-perennial streams. Here it's sort of a hybrid um, model, which we see a lot in sort of the real world. We're taking ArcGIS data analysis, pairing it with R and some of their um, CART functionality and also GBM to model flow across the whole watershed. And also we have many, many, many students who are doing collaborative projects through web interfaces who are finding more and more that people really want web because it's a way to communicate information across so many stakeholders who may not have any spatial um, background or any statistical background, but it really shows a lot of information in one place. And so we have students who are working on lots of different things. This one is a, is a map from the World Bank. Um, but it's a way to get sort of participatory, volunteer, collaborative spaces in an open source environment. So in conclusion, <laughs> okay, open source experiences are becoming expected. Big pro proprietary players are actually sort of seeing the writing on the wall and are encouraging hybrid models. So some of those databases are not connected. And from the open source environment, and most of our solutions that we need need the complexity, the ability to add on, um, as we sort of talked about already. And so it's really becoming a part, no nonsense part of what we're doing in the department. Okay, Wonderful. that's it. Another presentation. <laughs> <Run. three hours. laughs> Questions for our colleagues uh, in a uh, couple of colleagues uh, in uh, geography. Yeah. 
I have a question about the pedagogy component. So you mentioned there's a class on Python. Yes. Now, when the students come to that class, do they have programming background? And if not, how do you deal with that? <laughs> Carefully. Um, um, no, many of them don't. Um, and so we start very small and very project oriented so that there's sort of understanding in the context of a real world problem to solve. And so we add in functionality as needed and build from there after maybe a, a, you know, a day or two of actually the core of Python. Right. Very, very context and project oriented. That really seems to help them sort of put the picture together. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you, Megan. I was on the Educational Policy uh, Council, Educational Policy Committee uh, of the university last year, and one of the courses we approved was a new course in uh, computational linguistics. I thought, uh, we, I thought, and the program committee thought that that would make a perfect match, so we're moving from STEM to social STEM uh, into humanities uh, uh, to talk a little bit about what they're doing. In my view, as I mentioned to David electronically, I actually think we could do a, a digital humanities conference actually on campus. Um, some of you know of, of Scott Kleinman's work in this particular area, a national leadership role actually. Um, but here to talk to us a little bit about that and maybe some other things that he's interested in. <laughs> David, David, yeah. you're up. Great, thank you very much. Thank you for having me today. Um, my name is David Madero, so I'm in linguistics. This is my second um, second year here. How does this work now? Okay. Put this in my pocket? Clip it some, well, yeah, but you gotta turn it on first. Oh, is it not on? Sorry, it's on this is really embarrassing. Sorry, this is technology at its best, right? <laughs> so that just has to go oh, okay. And now we're good. Great. All right. Hi. OK. Um, yeah, so this is my uh, second year here. And I'm, uh, I feel pretty out of place because uh, I don't deal with uh, these huge data sets that we talked about in um, chemistry and uh, biology. So um, the, the issue in linguistics is um, how do we uh, make data about language that goes beyond the superficial? So many of the um, study, quantitative studies I see in linguistics are fairly, uh, to me at least, are fairly superficial and don't get at the um, structural issues that formal linguists, theoretical linguists like myself care about. So let me first, um, in this presentation, talk about some of the backgrounds of formal linguistics, what I mean by formal linguistics. Then I'm going to share with you a little project on linguistics um, so that you can then go home um, at your next cocktail party and share some facts with your friends um, about Hawaiian or English. And then I'm going to talk about some of the teaching application um, that I'm going to uh, start in spring. OK, so the roots of formal linguistics. So formal linguistics, as I see it, and linguistics is a very, very fractured field. There are many different um, viewpoints on what linguistics is. But to me, it's part of the cognitive sciences. We can see here that um, the sister fields of linguistics include things like um, neuroscience and artificial intelligence, which are big data type fields, but also fields like philosophy and anthropology, which traditionally are not uh, big data type fields. So this is one of the issues that, um, so historically speaking, it's a little hard to know how to make usable data um, from the kinds of things that we like to talk about in linguistics, um, the kind of um, categories of study, if, if you will. So my area of, of linguistics traditionally is more aligned with philosophy. It's a very um, sort of dedu deductive um, and uh, sort of rational in in inquiry. But it's hard, and the, and the data is very small and often based on speaker intuition. Okay, so, uh, um, but that's not always gonna, cu gonna cut it, um, as, as we'll see here in a second. I wanna also talk about some of the antecedents to my own work. So um, we can see some, some, some uh, examples here. Uh, so Saussure on the upper left-hand side um, talks about the relationship between signs and their meaning. Obviously, this is very small data, um, really philosophy in a lot of ways. Uh, we have um, on the bottom right, uh, Tarski. Um, he was a, a, a logician, and um, he was his, one of the students, Montague, at UCLA, was one of the great uh, semanticists who believed that uh, English could be viewed as a formal language, which, hadn't, um, which was pretty revo revolutionary at the time, actually. Uh, and then um, on the upper right hand side, we have James Murray, who is a philologist, that he is creating the Oxford English Dictionary here. So um, our keynote speaker, Rob, mentioned that um, data is something that can be digitized and analyzed. Well, we can see here, uh, we can see lots of um, information, right? It's definitely big, 
but is it data, right? Um, that's, that's one of the questions we have to, we have to think about. And um, how do we analyze it productively, usefully? And then finally, someone like uh, Ken Hale here, who is a, a MIT linguist, who is um, a field linguist. He's talking about in this, this picture is um, him discussing Wapiri, a language in a, in a native language of Australia. OK, so um, when, I think about, when I think about the antecedents of linguistics, uh, how to use data and how to organize it, um, it's not something that I learned in my graduate program. From, uh, there are graduate programs that deal with this, but not in my, in my field. So it's one of these things that I'm trying to grapple with right now. All right, so let me tell you about a project that I am working on, on currently that involves um, big-ish data, big-ish data relative to linguistics. So this is not um, trillion line um, Excel files, but um, something much, much smaller, but still uh, data oriented. OK, so let me talk about a project now. And I'm going to have to give you some background information. It's on what we call valency in Hawaiian. All right, so first of all, let me just clarify. I'm talking about a language that is known as Hawaiian that is um, spoken in, in Hawaii. And uh, we uh, roughly think there are about 200 native speakers of this language. And almost all of them live on this island, Niihau. So probably many of you have traveled to Hawaii. I'm not sure if any of you have uh, heard of Niihau. I know that none of you have been there, including myself, because it's privately owned. So people live on this island the way they did in the 1800s, 1700s, 1600s. There's no running water. There's no electricity. You can leave. If you're born there, you can leave. But um, if you're not born there, you cannot go there. So it's privately owned, and um, there's a long history with it. And the vast majority of speakers of Hawaiian live on that island and uh, don't, don't leave. And uh, the, some of the, the only really place to find native speakers of Hawaiian that's not on that island, Niihau, is on Kauai. So you can find people from, um, from Niihau on Kauai, and they are speakers uh, of Hawaiian, but they're very reluctant to work with outsiders. So I was lucky enough to sit down with some speakers of Hawaiian and record them uh, for a different project. But uh, it's something to think about. I'm going to come back to this in a second, what it means, um, what it means to speak a language that is, uh, that's dying, frankly, um, and that, that exists in very few, um, that's not really documented. All right, but before I can do that, I need to talk about some, um, I want to talk about my research projects that I'm going to discuss. But before I can even do that, I have to introduce a term for you, which is valency, which we borrow from chemistry. And uh, valency um, has to do with the number of what are called arguments that, um, uh, a word takes, is that's the word we, what we say in linguistics. So if we think about some different um, verbs in English, like arrive, that's, that has one argument. You can simply say Watson arrived, one argument, and that's, that's fine. With solve, that has two arguments. You can say something like Watson solves problems. So this is one argument, that's the second argument. You can't just say um, uh, Watson solves, period, without some sort of big context to make it uh, grammatical. You have these two different um, nominal arguments to go with the verb. And then finally, a verb like give can have three arguments. Watson gave Sherlock an idea. OK, so um, that's what I'm talking about today, valency in Hawaiian. Um, so we have um, valency changing operations in English that are systematic. Uh, they're not super common, but they are systematic in English. Something like bath has no arguments. It's a, it's a noun. But bathe has one, So um, or maybe two. I bathe. Yeah, I bathe. I bathe my child. Uh, tooth has no arguments because it's a, it's a noun, but teeth has, has one. You know, my baby is teething, right? Um, teething is painful. So uh, th that's, that's a process that raises the valency of words in English. And Hawaiian has a very productive valency changing operation. Uh, there are two different um, prefixes that you can use to increase the valency of a Hawaiian, um, Hawaiian word. So here's a word haole, which means white person. And um, ho'o, is the prefix, ho haole is to act like a white person. So that raises the valency of this, um, of this word. And then we have kua'e, which is the tropic bird, which is a real bird. That's the tropic bird right there. And uh, ha'a kua'e. So this means to act like a tropic bird. So if a bird is just like not landing, soaring over the ocean waves, then that is a, um, acting like a tropic bird. Thanks. So uh, this is raising the valency. <clears throat> we also have. Um, we can increase valency for verbs in English, too, something like sit, set, lay, la, uh, lie, lay. And we can see these things here again in Hawaiian. The um, spelling is a little different because of other processes. But uh, we can say something like I to eat, ho I to feed. That's, um, so in English, we have eat, feed. They're not related morphologically. But in Hawaiian, it is I, ho I, eat, and feed. And then um, apuka to cheat, ha apuka to cause to cheat, so to make someone cheat. That's valency increasing. 
OK, um, but the puzzle is, is that uh, these two different prefixes, they, they kind of go together in weird ways. It seems rather unpredictable. So we say something like nui large, you can say something like nui large, ha nui to exaggerate, to enlarge in, and then ho ha nui. We should all practice that at home tonight in the privacy of your own room, saying ho ha nui, um, which is to cause to brag or to cause to exaggerate. And then um, here, this is where it gets tricky. Ko'o is a brace or pole. Ho'o ko'o is to prop with a pole. But ha'a ko'o has the same exact meaning of ho'o ko'o. OK, so the question is, are ho'o and ha'a the same thing, or are they different things? That's the question. So um, these two linguists, um, uh, Pakui and Elbert, say they're actually two different things. Ho'o and ha'a are separate things. Like um, word negation in English, possible, impossible, happy, unhappy. Im, un, they're different things. Um, but maybe uh, they're the same thing. For example, think of plurality in, in English. My, I would say there's only one plural. Like goose, geese, that's just one realization of plural. Um, cat, cats, that's another one. And the reason for this is that when we have other processes, like compounding, when you say mongoose, you don't say mongeese. You say mongooses, right? So this is evidence that um, there's one plural in English that competes for different pronunciations, OK? Just like spider, man, man, spider, man. It's not spider, man. If you had multiple spider, man, it's um, spider, man. Google it, spider, man. You'll see spider, man's not spider, man. OK, thanks. I know I'm way over. And so uh, to, to answer this question, you can't just sit down with a native speaker. First of all, there are very few native speakers of Hawaiian. The other problem is that um, people are really not aware of these facts of their own language. Um, like, you can't say, you know, it's weird to say mon, 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 goose, mon geese, right? Um, so the way to do this is to, um, or I would argue, to make a corpus. So uh, using a, a dictionary, a very large dictionary, going back to that big dictionary with all the data items, it's not organized. So the question is, how do you organize the data such that you can analyze it in a useful way, digitized, um, digitized information, right? So that's what we did for this. I did for this project with the help of a couple of graduate students here, um, is to make this large, relatively large, corpus um, of all the interactions between these two items, these two prefixes. OK, and then um, the corpus can be shared um, for uh, non-quantitative re uh, 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 non quantitative study, uh, non-quantitative non study, but also descriptive and inferential statistics. And uh, my data, my fieldwork data, for example, is um, not this data yet, but my fieldwork data is now housed at the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. Um, as, and then that can be used as part of the revitalization project that's ongoing in Hawaii. Finally, um, very briefly, um, the computational methods, that is building corpuses like this using um, computer programs like Python, uh, that's something I'm trying to I, I am developing here. Uh, and that's a new thing for our department. So I have this course coming up in the spring, computational linguistics. Despite the high number, 455, it is actually an introduction to Python for linguists. That way, our students, many of them, most of them, will not become linguists, but then they can leave this uh, university um, saying, yes, I can code, or I have some coding experience and can take it from there. All right, so the goals are biggish data, um, relatively big data for linguistics, digitized and e easy to access, and um, open. That is useful for not just linguists, but others as well. OK, thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for the rush there. The okay, end. there's a presentation where I'm sure we could all come up with a couple of dozen questions, and I think we want to take the class too. Right. <laughs> Juicy. Okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> okay. So, do do you use uh, this uh, 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 tools like uh, uh, Yak and Lex that are that are used in uh, compiler development for syntax analysis? That that would seem to like like a reasonable thing to do. The first one I'm not familiar with, but, um, but, but I, I don't personally use the second I, uh, tool, Lex, but um, I, do, I definitely know um, people who work on large scale parsing um, analysis, where you're really um, interfacing with, um, you know, with, with parsed language, where some poor you know, graduate student, unfortunately, goes and parses some language. Then a computer learns from the human tagged um, items, and then you, the computer can run with it from there. Yeah, I, that's not something that I do. My focus has been more on theoretical questions in linguistics, but that's the kind of thing that I hope my students will be able to do um, with this course as a foundation. Yeah, I was thinking that the, from the computational point of view, it's pr it would be probably easier to use that rather than uh, Python. Because yeah. Python is not really like a build for this. But, uh, the, the right, right. Sort of so I'm using Python here to build corpora to answer okay. theoretical okay. questions. Okay. Yeah, yeah, very good question. Thank you. My sense is over time is in some, some cases, the packages are more important than the actual base coding platform. So sometimes we use the base coding platform just because the package is available. Does, uh, 
Does that, I don't know if that makes sense, at least from a user end user perspective sometimes. Another question for David. Is this on? Yes. OK, David, let's give you a hand. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. I'm sorry I'm moving quickly. It's just we're almost at lunch, but we have one more speaker. And, um, and all of these people are on campus. They're not going anywhere, <laughs> except on trips, except it's a little harder to go internationally, I understand, from my email yesterday. Um, so you can always find them. As a teaching institution, we thought it best to end with open as it relates to teaching and learning, although you know, our research and service and consulting work is important. Um, the most important, probably, at the end of the day is how we use open, however it's defined, to encourage and nurture the success of our students in various ways. And so the program committee invited yeah. Mark Schilling up. Uh, Mark has been using a tool that was developed at Carnegie Mellon, as they would say in Denver, Carnegie Mellon, um, uh, called the Open Learning Initiative, if I remember correctly, uh, run by Candace Steele. Some of you may remember Candace was on campus here a few months ago. She's now at Stanford, if I remember correctly. That's correct. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, and Mark is here to talk a little bit about that. I call it, think of it as the personalized learning designer in Moodle. So I'm talking a little bit while we're getting it's going to restart in two uh, minutes. Do not you know how personalized learning designer <laughs> sets up where you can do Just more individualized that. approaches uh, okay. for students. So you can set up a, uh, a, get it a, a path, an individual pathway for success, now. sort of the way the what GMAT measure? and the GRE okay. are, are tested now. Um, the, the, the advantage of the Open Learning Initiative is it has a whole bunch of machine learning algorithms on the server side that give the students immediate feedback, as opposed to the very coarse feedback that you would give, coarse, C-O-A-R-S-E, feedback that you would give to the student at an individual level. And Mark's been getting good results with that um, uh, for his elementary statistics here. <laughs> uh, course here at Northridge. Thank you for the ad lib. Sorry, <laughs> sorry for, I, think I hope I didn't steal any thunder. I was just trying you to introduce. Yeah. Your so my work. computer is going to restart in 27 seconds. <laughs> so we're, I've emailed the presentation over to the other. The, so, the, the, the bottom here. line for our conference, which is why we allocated more time for faculty we're presentations right than for anything here. else, is in our campus, but on any large teaching campus, it's what we choose to do with our students that matters. Maybe not only, but mostly. What we choose to do or not choose to do with our students. I mean, administration sets up an structure for that. Uh, but most importantly, <laughs> it's what we do. So that's why we allocated the most of that time to disparate faculty around the campus. And these are just samples of the talks. We could easily fill a whole, uh, a whole couple of hours with more talks from both STEM, non-STEM, okay. and a variety of other disciplines around campus. Close this window. Not to mention engaging with our community college partners and other partners okay. as well. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, Mark Schilling uh, from uh, math. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> and I wouldn't say step because it's not a department. It's no, it's just mathematics. Math. Is the mic on? Uh, is, the green, is. is the green uh, light on on the thing? What do I do? Just, just do that. And now you're on. Okay, great. So I'm going to talk about how open access has actually impacted um, one of our courses. It's actually the largest FTE course we have in the math department. It's what is it, close to 2,000 FTE, something crazy like that. But we only use the hybrid for a couple of, for a few sections. Anyway, um, so this is Math 140, Introductory Statistics. And let me bring this back over here. And the hybrid course was developed um, just almost 10 years ago, so we've been running it since about 2007, and it's based on the Open Learning Initiative, which is a program at Carnegie Mellon. And they have courses not just in statistics, but in many, many different areas, so you might want to check that out and, and see what, uh, you can actually look at those courses for free, so you can look through them completely, see what they look like, so. Okay, so um, our, our goal was to create a hybrid course that would meet for half the time as a normal four-unit Math 140 course, um, which obviously um, lessens the lo load on university resources and exploits advantages of both in-class and online styles of instruction. So we wanted to develop a course that would um, address the principles for both contact and effective pedagogy. Um, and 
Rob had earlier mentioned gaze, so you see mentioned here that this greatly influenced uh, how we uh, developed this course. So how the course works is we have two 50-minute uh, sections per week instead of the usual four, or we might typically meet actually for twice as long as 50 minutes. Um, and students get the course content through the internet, through the Open Learning Initiative, or OLI, um, which is ADA compliant. So there is no course textbook for the course, um, but we have developed a 200-page workbook which has a lot of different things, but, uh, activities and just summaries, but, but not really presenting material um, that would be normally part of, of the course in a textbook form. So it does cost $25, it's a nominal cost for students, and that's really the price to have a grade book and have their scores entered and things like that. Um, so there's, I'm not, I'm not gonna read everything here. You, you have all the slides um, that you can look at, so you can just take a look at what's available, and then in a minute I'll show you what the um, OLI uh, screens look like get a sense of how, how it's structured. So as far as how we use it, um, we don't lecture. Well, very little. Okay, so maybe we use five to ten minutes to just summarize some basic things. Or if students have sent us questions, we can address those. But um, the bulk of our time in class is spent on hands-on activities, but occasionally we'll have quizzes on the readings and, uh, and of course, normal exams. So here's a, one of the screens from LI. You can see how it's structured over here with this uh, unit and module based form and you just click to open each of these things and uh, you can also see a diagram showing kind of the big picture perspective that the course takes, which I think is nice. They keep coming back to this theme over and over. Um, here's a typical um, uh, display that you'll see where you have a lesson that can be done by clicking here and running through the movie, um, but you can also see the movie in static form. So we do have that, uh, you know, for any of our students, for example, who might be deaf or hard of hearing, they, they have an option here that they can use. All right, so tons of assessments, and this is broken down into the ones we use in class and the ones that come with the OLI. Um, so we have our own in-class quizzes. As I said, mostly those are just to make sure students have done that reading. Um, they're very basic. And then we have midterms and a final, the usual sort of thing, and regular graded homework. And they do have a term project, which they turn in over and over and get comments each time. And we do progressive stages as they're going through the course. They're now able to do the next step to that project. And now as far as OLI, there are many different uh, self-assessments that you can see here, things such as did I get this and learn by doing, which are scaffolded um, assessments, and then stat tutor, which are significant projects. They can take up to an hour to do and really go through the entire process from start to finish of, of a statistical problem. And then now we also have my response, or they have, OLI has my response, where students are asked to uh, what do they think about something? You know, what is the conclusion they would make from what they've just um, done, let's say? And they'll write in a response. And then once they've done that, they can compare it to what the systems suggest would be a good response. And they can also address questions to the instructor. So the instructors can look at what has been uh, contributed and prepare for the next class based on those sorts of things. Um, here's an example of how you see the um, personalized learning design. So a student selects one of the answers and then this pops up. So this was, I deliberately suggest, uh, selected the wrong answer here so you could see the sort of thing that you might, uh, that the student might see and then they can try again and get the correct answer with a, a green indicator. So this is called, did I get this? And that's a lot of checks like that. So here um, is a really nice thing that wasn't in the original OLI, but, OLI, but they brought that in in recent years uh, called the Learning Dashboard, which just keeps track of how students are doing on each particular learning objective. And so it has sub-objectives as well. So the gray indicates that some students haven't. So this is the number of students who have, done e have achieved each level. So if it's gray, that means students that haven't even started it yet. Red, they've just got it wrong. 
orange part of it was right, and if green, they've, they've, they've got it completely right. So you can see that this is something that you really don't need to address in class. Almost everybody's got, everybody who's tried it has gotten that right just fine, and here's something that's more mixed, and we might want to spend more time on that. Here's another um, illustration of how OLI keeps track of data for you to use to, to see where your class is. Um, how many students have actually gotten to work on this? 20 out of 25. How much have they progressed through it um, for the whole module? 24% of the assignments. That may or may not be that useful to you. And then on the specific um, assignments, you can track how many students are getting what percentage right. So you see, you know, again, some, per some percentages are higher than others. And, uh, you have a real good idea of where to go in class with what to emphasize. And I know this is both formative and summative assessment. We can use this to redesign our own class activities in the future based on things where we see they may have had more trouble. All right. Um, finally, to evaluate the performance of this course, um, when we first started the course, we ran it um, in that first year and decided to compare how students did to how they do with our traditional courses. So we selected a number of courses and gave this chaos exam, nice name, Comprehensive Assessment of Outcomes in a First Statistics course, and looked at the performance gains, um, post-test minus pre-test, and the two hybrid sections did actually outperform the three regular sections just in the course. Um, the only section that did better was an honors course, so maybe that's not surprising that that would happen. So we were encouraged by that and have decided to keep offering the hybrid course regularly. Um, and we've kept track over the years. Passage rates have generally been somewhat higher in the hybrid course than in our regular Math 140 sections. And that's it. Question. Questions for Mark? Uh, did, do you have a way of correcting the system? Like if you find... I'll use the mic. Oh, please, thank you. Do you have a way of correcting... Yeah. Do you have a way of correcting the system? So if like students find that a question is flawed, that because it seems like you have this huge body of, uh, of questions and kind of labyrinthine ways of making it through the material. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah. Well, no, there's not really any way to, uh, to tailor the system to your, own, to your own needs or what you've discovered. Just basically contact the, the people at uh, OLI and let them know there's an issue there and they promise to address that. So every year, every summer, I believe, they are trying to improve the OLI and so that's when those things are handled. I actually have a question. Are none of the, these classes aren't using Moodle. No. At all for no. anything. That's so therefore, you won't be involved in the Canvas transition necessarily. You'll continue to use OLI because yes. the value proposition to the students is on the feedback that they get individually, not necessarily on the base infrastructure from one vendor to another vendor. No, that's right. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. I didn't want to lead the witness there. I'm just yeah, yeah. trying to think through. <laughs> I'm trying to think through. I was an administrator for 12 years of my life, so I'm thinking through all the logistics, not just as a faculty member. Other questions for Mark? OK, uh, good. Let's give him a hand.